Well, I've been up since 5 in the morning. For the Spanish, we had the celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I was going to try to get a nap before the 9 o'clock Mass, but I never got it. So those of you that may be tempted to fall asleep during the homily, I'm with you. <laughs> I feel your pain. Um, this weekend, we just to clarify, as we prepare for Lent, we celebrate the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, just to let you know why all these statues are here and these images of Mary. And it's a very significant thing for the Mexican people because Our Lady was heaven's missionary to bring them to Christ. She appeared to uh, a man, Juan Diego, who's now Saint Juan Diego, who was one of the few converts of the missionaries, the Spanish missionaries, had been able to bring over from the pagan Aztec religion, which was also involved in bloody human sacrifice. And uh, the miraculous appearance of Our Lady in the image and the conversions that resulted brought an end to that bloody human sacrifice and the pagan worship. And that's one of the reasons we look to Our Lady of Guadalupe to help us bring an end to abortion, which is, uh, again, really human sacrifice for the God of convenience. So as we look at the story, St. Uh, Juan Diego is told by the Blessed Mother who appeared to him on his way um, to church to go and tell the bishop to have a church built in her honor on that site. So when he went to the bishop, the bishop, of course, didn't believe him. He probably figured, how much tequila have you had today there, Juan? You know, uh, this is my version, so I'm not quite sure how accurate that part is. But anyway, so basically the bishop needed proof. So he saw the Blessed Mother again, and there were flowers blooming in the cold. And like this weekend we've had the snow. Certainly wouldn't expect to have flowers blooming, but they were blooming there. And she told him to pick the flowers and put them in his garment. When he went back to show the bishop the flowers, he just thought he was going to show the bishop the flowers. Well, the flowers dissolved into his garment, forming the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So the resulting conversions of thousands and the missionaries were getting worn out with the number of converts that were baptized. So the miraculous image of Our Lady and, the, and her message uh, resulted in the conversion of millions. It's kind of ironic because at that time, 1531, it's a few years after Martin Luther started his revolt against the church in Europe and was bringing uh, you know, a lot of people out of the Catholic Church and so Mary goes to the opposite side of the world to bring them there. And so the Blessed Mother came and her message was to a Catholic bishop to build a Catholic church which would have the Eucharist. And she appeared on the feast of what was then at that time the 12th, the Immaculate Conception, which has now been moved to the 8th of December. So the image has been one that has been studied by scientists and found to not have any um, visible brush strokes. They don't know what kind of, it doesn't seem to have been painted. They don't know what the image is made out of. It has unusual qualities. It also maintains the same temperature as the human body. The eyes have a reflective quality in which you can see um, the bishop and the people in the room. Like if, if you were to look into a live human eye, you would see a reflection. And um, the stars in her cloak match exactly, um, astronomically, the stars that would have been present at that time. And uh, she has her head bowed in prayer, which of course is a form of submission, and her hands folded in prayer, showing that she is not a goddess, that she represents the true God, because we do not worship Mary, we honor her, and the role of Mary is to bring us Jesus. And so she not only does that by giving birth to him and giving him to the world, but she also does that through her messages and her miracles and her prayers. So her ministry continues from heaven here on earth. When God sends his mother to earth with a message and a miracle, we should pay attention. So this particular one was, of course, to build the church um, where the Eucharist would be. And so um, the presence of Christ is very significant. When we come into this church, we open the doors, we are entering into the presence of Christ, and that's why we genuflect out of respect 
Scripture says, every knee shall bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we had uh, Jesse Ramiro here this weekend, and he gave a talk yesterday um, at 11 o'clock. Unfortunately, with the snow, I imagine a lot of people probably missed it. So I'm going to mention to you a couple of stories that he brought that I think were significant some information. Talked about one of the cities in Mexico, I think it was Juarez, I'm trying to remember. So anyway, I'm not good with all these Spanish things. But anyway, it was a city where the um, two drug cartels had taken over. One was controlling the police department and one was controlling the military. So the people had no recourse, really. They couldn't get any help. The, they, whatever the, the drug people decided, that's what would happen. So the priests there said that we need to do something about this. And he got together with the other 10 parishes and they said, we're going to have adoration every day, all day. We're going to expose the Blessed Sacrament, we're going to have people praying. And the murder rate there, okay, our, our largest murder rate is in Chicago, around 600 people killed every year. So that's our murder capital here in the United States. Well, this town was smaller and they had a murder rate of 2,700 a year. So, they started the adoration, and eventually the power of Christ unleashed in the Eucharist, the people turning to him, eventually the police and the army guys would come in with their machine guns, and they would kneel down before our Lord. And Jesus began to make a difference, and within three years, the murder rate went from 2,700 to 53 a year. So that's the power of the Eucharist. And remember, our chapel is open 24 hours a day for people to go and adore our Lord in the Eucharist. We have adoration before Mass with the rosary at each of the Masses, and we have adoration on Thursdays, uh, first Friday evenings, and we have adoration on the second Saturday throughout the night, the International Nocturnal Adoration. So we encourage you to come and visit our Lord in the Eucharist. So I've made a couple of points. The Blessed Mother asked to have a church built which would have our Lord in the Eucharist, a Catholic church. I mentioned what happened when they had adoration in this city. And I will have a third point I want to make, which I take from Jesse's information about, and this is a little creepy, but I think it's interesting because it gives us sort of the opposite side, the negative view that supports the truth of the Eucharist. He has had Satanists that he has interviewed with on his show, and some of whom he told me converted eventually, but the point that the Satanists had to say about the church was they don't bother getting a Koran to desecrate or a statue of Buddha or something like that. All the Satanists all over the world have one primary focus, to get their hands on a Eucharist for a black mass in which they desecrate the Blessed Sacrament. We have adoration and reverence. They have the opposite. Again, I apologize for the creepiness, but the point here is that the Satanists aren't bothering with any other religion. Their understanding is that that is the true presence of Christ. They hate Christ. They hate the Catholic Church. They believe it to be the true church of God. And so they seek to make war against God because they are following the other guy. And that's where the directives from hell come to attack the Eucharist. And so what else do they do? They try to get us to turn away from God and, and avoid sin. Well, he talked also about how Father Amor, the chief exorcist in Rome, made a statement that going to confession is a hundred times more powerful than the exorcism prayer. Why? Well, we make a distinction. Possession involves a demon taking control of your body. They cannot possess the soul. The soul is the sovereign territory between man and God. That's the one place that they cannot enter, but they can control the body and have temptations and influence that way. So when we go to confession, if we are in a state of mortal sin, whatever claim the devil had on our soul is now broken, destroyed, and we are returned to Christ because everyone is either in a state of mortal sin or a state of grace. There's no third option. It's one way or the other. So the goal of the demons is to, is to get us to be in a state of sin. So obviously, you know, um, 
confession is a very powerful instrument that helps us come around. So we need to remember that many times the line for Holy Communion is long, but the line to the confessional is short. So does that mean we have lots of super holy people running around? I hope so. Or it could mean that we have some people that need to go to confession first before going to communion or going to communion when they haven't been to confession and they need to go, which would mean the denial of sin. So the thing about possession, you know, there's different levels. The first level of the demonic attack is the one we are most familiar with, temptation. And temptation leads us to sin, and sin can lead us to a lot of problems. Now, true possession is a rather rare thing. People, you know, we've had, you can get some problems, though, some obsession where a demon will come for a while and cause a problem. We had that Charlie game where those kids were inviting the demon in called Charlie, and they were playing this little game, the Charlie game that was going around for a while, and Ouija boards where you, you open yourself up, and you have to remember, the soul is meant to open our heart. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man opens, I will come and be with him, and he will be my son. So the idea is we open the door, the spiritual doors of our heart, mind, and soul to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell with us in grace, through the sacraments, baptism, the Holy Communion, through prayer. Well, what happens if we close the doors to the Holy Spirit by turning our backs on God, our backs on prayer, our backs on the sacrament of confession, and we open the door to sin, violations of the Ten Commandments, addictions to impurities and drugs and alcohol. Well, then you start opening those doors along with the doors like the occult and going to seances and palm readers and things like that and tarot cards and Ouija boards. Well, yeah, then you're going to be opening the door to the unholy spirits. So you either have the one Holy Spirit of God with you, or you're at risk of the unholy spirits coming and entering into your life and influencing your soul. So the first level of the demonic attack is temptation. That's the basic one. The next level is obsession, and then the third one is possession. So, um, again, it's rare that someone would have possession, you know, that's a, it's a rather frightening thing and you have to have a trained exorcist for that. But one of the things we need to remember, we can, we can defend ourselves, especially through the rosary. The rosary is very powerful. A person who is in a state of grace, especially devoted to Our Lady, receives the sacraments worthy, confession, and the Eucharist, they are protected from the devil. And I will give you uh, another example that Jesse pointed out, and I've heard this story before. I never heard it in the detail that he told. Apparently it comes in the court proceedings. He uh, talked about Ted Bundy, the serial rapist killer, who was on the loose some years ago, and he was in Florida at the university. Now Florida, I believe, finally executed him after they arrested him. But he uh, went into one of the girls' dorms and he raped and killed one of the girls Friday night, came back to the same university but went to the girls' dorm on the other side, and he went down the hall checking doors and he found a door unlocked and he went into the room and there was this girl lying on the bed with the rosary in her hands. And her mother had told her, made her promise to pray the rosary every day while she went to college. And so she was praying the rosary. And one of the promises of, of Mary to Christians who pray the rosary is her special protection. So here is Bundy having, I don't know how many women he raped and killed, like 20 or 30, 40, I can't remember, but it was a large number. Um, so he's going towards this girl asleep in bed alone, and there's this rapist murderer coming for his next victim. And he said, all of a sudden, this is in the court proceedings, he said, I felt this fear that I never felt before. Something was making me afraid. And I was pushing against an invisible wall and I couldn't get any closer to her. He said, so I, I got confused and panicked and I just turned around and he left the room and went after another girl somewhere else. But the power of the rosary, Our Lady, the Blessed Mother of God, and the prayers, when we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. 
Remember Genesis 3.15, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. What's the offspring of the woman? Jesus Christ. Who's the woman? Mary. Who's the serpent's offspring? Those who follow the devil and rebel against God. The Pharisees, they're at the bottom. They're the ones calling for Jesus to be crucified. Yelling out, come down from the cross and we believe because that's the condition of the world. The world doesn't want the cross. The world says, give me a religion without sacrificial love for God and neighbor. I don't want the cross. I want it easy. That's not the way it is. The new tree of life is the cross. And every tree bears fruit. There was the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and that brought sin into the world with Adam and Eve. Now we have the new tree of life, which is the cross. What is the fruit of the cross? The body and blood of Christ. The body, blood, soul, and divinity, which we have in the Eucharist. And so we come to get the antidote to sin. And we, as I said, we need to make sure we are leading a life of prayer, going to confession worthily and ready to come and receive Holy Communion so that we're not committing a, a sacrilegious communion, but one that gives us grace. So when we come into the church here, we are in the presence of our Eucharistic Lord, the one that conquered the two drug cartels who attacked that town. The one who sent his mother with the miraculous image of Our Lady Guadalupe that the communists tried to blow up and they destroyed half the church and the image of Our Lady was preserved. An image studied by NASA scientists, the same ones that studied the Shroud of Turin, and they found they could not figure out what caused the image or what made it. They can't make a duplicate. They, they don't understand. It's a mystery. It's a, it's a miraculous and amazing cloth. And so the rosary is there with Our Lady to pray for us and with us, to help us get to heaven, to lead us to Jesus in the Eucharist. That was the mission of Our Lady Guadalupe, to have a church built that would provide the Eucharist for those people to receive our Lord. So today, as we get closer to Christmas and we see the message of John the Baptist to prepare and be ready for the Lord, we are reminded that God has provided wonderful means for us to prepare for the celebration of the birth of Christmas as well as the eternal celebration of heaven. It starts here and now with Eucharistic adoration, going to confession, receiving our Lord in communion worthily and holily, studying the Word of God, praying the Word of God, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Rosary, and receiving all these wonderful spiritual gifts that God offers us. Remember, there are gifts that the world offers that are often connected to sin. And those aren't true gifts, they are traps, they are lies sent to us from hell to, to pull us away from the path to heaven. Let us follow the teachings of our Lord and follow the path of prayer, follow the path of the bread of life and the Eucharist and turn to the wonderful gift he gave us from the cross. Behold your mother. He has given us his mother to be our mother as his last words from the cross as he was dying. And she is there to pray for us and with us and help us to be on the safest, quickest, and best road to heaven to be forever with her son in paradise.